I'm Andrew Jackson. I'm the Economic Geologist with Sprott Global Resource Investments, and I'm responsible for the technical evaluations of the mineral companies and their properties that Sprott Global invests in. I put together this Ore Deposit 101 series of talks to help non-technical people understand ore deposits. The talks highlight some of the features of the main deposit types that investors in the resource sector may come across and provide an introduction to the jargon you will find in press releases put out by exploration and mining companies. This is the ninth talk in the Ore Deposit 101 series and it focuses on uranium deposits. I'll start with a general discussion of uranium, its uses, production, resources and the main uranium ore minerals. Then I want to focus the bulk of the talk on the types of uranium ore deposits, discussing as I go along how those deposit types are formed and how we go about exploring for them. Then I'll talk briefly about how uranium deposits are mined and how the ore is treated to produce a final saleable product. As usual, I'll end up with a short list of critical takeaway points. So let's start off with some background to uranium and the uranium mining industry. What makes uranium of particular economic importance is its radioactivity. Uranium decays through a series of reactions to form a number of new elements thorium, radium, radon, polonium, and lead. And at each of these steps, it spins off alpha particles from the nucleus and produces energy. Uranium is not a rare element. It's found in most rocks, although it is more common in felsic rocks like granite than in mafic rocks like gabbro. Granite generally contains about five parts per million of uranium. This grade would be more than enough to form an economic deposit if we were dealing with gold, but uranium needs a lot of natural enrichment to reach economic grades. Uranium's average crustal abundance is 2.7 parts per million, which makes it twice as common as molybdenum or tin, uh, 40 times more abundant than silver, and 500 times more abundant than gold. But the lowest grade primary uranium deposits being mined today have about 100 times of this uh, crustal abundance. The highest grade deposits have about 5 million times this concentration. Uranium grades are usually expressed in terms of percent U308. The usual saleable end product is U308, or yellow cake as it is commonly called. This contains approximately 85% of uh, uranium by weight. But uranium is an emotive product with its mental associations with power station disasters, nuclear weapons, and the fear of the invisible. The ghosts of Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima loom large in the public's mind. Much of the future demand for uranium depends upon this emotive factor. The war of words waged between those strongly in favour of nuclear power versus those passionately against it. However, in the long run, population pressure and the rising standards of living of third world countries will force governments to rely heavily on nuclear energy to power their nations. In spite of Fukushima incident, the number of new reactors being constructed is increasing. Whereas there have been virtually no new nuclear reactors built in the US or Canada in the last 30 years. In fact, four nuclear power stations were closed down in the first half of 2013. As of 2013, July 2013, the US has three in construction and another nine being planned. China, by comparison, has 28 under construction, 43 more in the planning stage, and 118 proposed. For Russia, the same figures are 10 under construction, 24 in planning, and 20 proposed. For India, 7, 18, and 29. So these are large numbers of reactors, and they're going to need uranium to power them. So where are they going to get it all from? 
Let's look first at where the current supply is coming from. The top producers globally, in order of the size of production, are Kazakhstan, by far and away the biggest producer, Canada, Australia, Niger, Namibia, Russia, Uzbekistan, USA, China, Mal Malawi, and Ukraine. Looking ahead, the list of defined uranium world uranium resources is somewhat different. Canada stands head and shoulders above the rest of the world, thanks largely to the Athabasca Basin. It's followed by Brazil, Uzbekistan, China, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Niger. Interestingly, the uranium that was used in the world's first two atomic bombs was mined in the Congo DRC, a country which doesn't even feature on the current list of either producers or holders of resources. Uranium metal is a most unimpressive looking material. It's a dull, silver-gray material. It's heavy, uh, with specific gravity of 18.7, almost the same as gold. But unlike gold, uranium and metal never occurs in the elemental form in nature. It's always combined with other elements. And these are some of the more common uh, uranium ore minerals. Uraninite, including pitchbend, is one of the most common ore minerals. It has a black, lustrous color and is an oxide of uranium. Branerite, another more complex oxide, it's also black, and though it may have a slightly yellowish tinge sometimes. Carnotite is also a complex, but common. Uh, it's complex, but more common than uranium ore mineral, and it's usually bright yellow or orange, and it's most common in secondary uranium deposits. Those where the uranium is deposited by groundwater. Uranophane, a hydrated calcium uranium silicate. It's yellow-green in color, but it'll fluoresce bright green if you put it under a UV black light. And finally, autunite, a calcium uranium phosphate, is also yellowish-green in color. <coughs> now let's move on to the various deposit types that uranium occurs in. There are at least 14 different deposit types. Uh, as you will probably have noticed, some geologists are inveterate splitters but only six of these are really economically significant in global terms. These can be broadly grouped into two. Primary deposits, where the uranium um, is introduced with the original magma, and secondary deposits, where the uranium is dissolved by groundwater and then redeposited re from solution. I'll start with the primary deposits. And I'll start by coming back to the same slide that I've used in all the other Ore Deposit 101's talks. You'll remember the cool, dump the dull stuff and skim off the cream process, so I won't labor that point. Most of the primary uranium deposits are associated with either IOCGs, iron oxide copper gold deposits, or with mesothermal veins and pegmatites, in other, wor in other words, deposited directly from magmas or by hydrothermal uh, fluids derived from felsic rocks at intermediate depths. The first of these primary uh, deposit types are the IOCGs. Virtually the only economic uranium deposit of this kind, type is BHP Billiton's giant Olympic Dam deposit in South Australia. Although it is only the only significant IOCG uranium mine, it produces almost 4,000 tons of U308 per annum, making it the second largest producer in the world after MacArthur River, which provides about 6% uh, of global uh, uranium production. Olympic Dam has an incredibly low uranium grade of just 0.034% U308, and the only reason it can produce at this grade is that it's, prim it's primarily a copper producer, and the uranium is just a fortunate byproduct. The resources at Olympic Dam are a stunning 9.5 billion tons. There were plans to double the annual production, 
but environmental and anti-nuclear protests have put these plans on the back burner for the time being. Here is a section through the Olympic Dam area from a paper by Haynes et al. It's pretty old, but I don't think the model has changed much since 1995 when it was published. The genetic model calls for a mixing of cool, shallow, saline, oxidizing groundwater from within the basaltic volcanics, which are yellow in the section, with hot, deep, more reduced magmatic water, blue in the section. The uranium is postulated to have been brought in with the shallow saline water and precipitated in the mixing zone due to reduction. As you will see, this precipitation of uranium from an oxidized fluid as a result of reduction is a common theme in uranium deposits. The top of the Olympic Dam mineralization is at a depth of 350 meters below surface, buried under transport cover and barren post-mineral sediments. The mine has been operating as an underground mine since its inception. The new expansion would call for the development of a super pit. The mineralized rocks are quite impressive, being full of red hematite, various green uranium minerals, blue bornite, and black magnetite, pitch blend, and branerite. So if Olympic Dam is hidden under 350 meters of overburden and post-mineral sediments, how did explorations discover it and the other ICGs that are simil similarly buried under co the cover of the Gawler Craton? Geochemistry won't work unless the deposit is at or close to the surface. Instead, geophysics plays a dominant role because IOCG deposits have several features that geophysical techniques can detect. If the deposit outcrops, radiometrics may work. However, this is not the case in the Olympic Dam area, but magnetics can detect the abundant magnetite that is often associated with IOCGs. Gravity may be able to differentiate between the heavy magnetite, hematite, and sulfides of the ore, and the lower density unmineralized rocks. You can see how well this worked at Olympic Dam, which was found due to both its gravity and magnetic geophysical signatures, although the two are not fully coincident and only overlap over a small po portion of the ore body. Sometimes, as is in the case of Punt Hill Target to the south, gravity outlines the permissive area, but pinpointing the actual mineralization is much more difficult. And finally, EM, or electromagnetics, may be able to detect an IOCG's massive sulfides. However, at the end of the day, as usual, drilling will be required to validate the geophysical anomaly. So much for IOCGs. Let's look now at the so-called intrusive related deposits. Although, as I said earlier, Granites generally contain higher background levels of uranium than mafic or ultramafic rocks. Primary deposits can be associated with intrusives of all sorts of different compositions. The Palabora deposit in South Africa, for example, is hosted in carbonatites and ultramafics. Intrusive-related uh, uranium deposits provide one of the clearest examples of magmatic concentration of metals with the uranium being concentrated in the last remnants of the magnet to crystallize. However, the grades are still some of the lowest of uranium deposits. For example, Rossing, in Namibia's Namib Desert, which you can see in this satellite image, has a grade of just 0.035%, just 70 times that of the average crustal abundance. Rossing was discovered way back in 1928, <clears throat> but with little use for uranium until after the Second World War and the development of, the, of nuclear power, it only finally got into production in 1976. Its share of the world production is steadily shrinking and is now only 3% compared to 7% five years ago. Uranium occurs as fine-grained ura uraninite and uranophane in alaskite a granite with virtually no mafic minerals. 
whereas Olympic Dam produces uranium only as a byproduct, Rossing is a pure uranium producer. In spite of its very low grade, it is economic because of its size, and importantly, the fact that the uranium minerals occur between the quartz and feldspar grains, grains, and it takes little grinding to achieve high recoveries. There are several other deposits nearby that are in advanced stages of exploration and uh, evaluation. As for the IOCGs, exploration for intrusive related uranium deposits relies very heavily on geophysics. I skimmed over radiometrics as an exploration tool when talking about the IOCGs, as the Olympic Dam is deeply buried. But let's talk a little bit about it here, as it provides pivotal uh, as it is a pivotal uh, exploration tool for shallow or outcropping deposits. As I mentioned earlier, uranium decays to produce alpha particle radiation, and this can be detected with a scintillometer or a spectrometer. If the radiation source is within, say, uh, 30 centimeters or one foot of the surface. Below this, the overlying material masks the radiation. Most radiometric surveys are flown using either a helicopter or fixed-wing uh, aircraft. An airborne spectrometer is more sophisticated than a scintillometer, and it can di differentiate between radiation from uranium, thorium, and potassium. Because they can't do this, the readings from scintillometers need to be taken with a pinch of salt, and much of this radiation could be simply from valueless potassium or thorium. Spectrometers rely on germanium or uh, sodium iodide crystals that fluoresce under, irra under radiation. A spectrometer's sensitivity depends on the size of that crystal, and it can vary from 15 to 30 liters in volume. This size obviously impacts the weight, as they weigh up to 100 kilograms, the weight of a very large man and hence the cost of uh, its impacts on the cost of flying a survey. Airborne radiometric surveys are usually combined with EM or magnetic surveys to make the most of the aircraft's availability. Once the radiometric data has been collected by the airborne survey, it's processed and plotted to provide maps of uranium, thorium and potassium radiation intensity. Here you can see one of those maps from a survey in Western Australia. You can see the uranium anomaly of the Magaburna uranium mineralization lighting up in red. Once radiation is detected from the airborne survey, exploration moves onto the ground for geological mapping, surface sampling, and of course drilling. Drilling can be core or RC. It's possible to get a very quick estimate of the, uh, of the uranium content by using downhole spectrometer probes like this. But this only gives counts per second, and you need to follow this up to the chemical assay of the core or chips in the lab to get results that can be used in estimating a, a resource. Okay, so much for primary uranium deposits. We'll now move on to the secondary uranium deposits, which I think are more interesting. They're classified as secondary because they result from groundwater leaching uranium from a primary magnetic uh, source rock. The uranium is then transported in solution and redeposited, often resulting in a major grade increase. So we're now moving from in this high up into this diagram to the very shallow areas where groundwater circulation plays an increasingly important part in the formation of ore deposits. Secondary uranium deposits are all founded on one underlying principle, namely that uranium is soluble in oxidized water, but insoluble in reduced water. So if we have a rock containing a low-grade uranium and oxidized groundwater flows through it, <clears throat> the uranium will be dissolved. If the uranium-bearing groundwater then encounters any reductant, the groundwater will be reduced and the uranium will precipitate straight out of solution. The most common reductants are carbon in the form of graphite or buried organic material or sulfides such as pyrite. 
So the secret to exploring for secondary uranium deposits is to consider a potential oxidized primary source, determine where the groundwater flowing through the source is likely to encounter these reductants. The so-called unconformity related deposits are some of the most important uranium deposits economically as well. And we'll start with these. And I'll spend quite a bit of time on them, given their importance to the uranium mining industry. What exactly is an unconformity related deposit? An unconformity is the erosion surface dividing the older, older and younger rocks usually of very different ages. You can see a typical unconformity in the photo, where the older rocks are un underneath were folded and eroded before the younger brown, red-brown sediments were deposited on top. The yellow line marks the unconformity. Sometimes the upper and lower rocks have very different degrees of oxidation, which makes the unconformity a redox boundary. Usually in these cases, the uranium is dissolved in relatively oxidized groundwater in the upper unit and then drops out of solution when this water mixes with reduced water in fractures in the lower unit. Depending on whether the groundwater is traveling upwards or downwards, so-called egress or ingress situations, the uranium will drop out in the upper or lower unit, but either way it is generally within a couple hundred meters of the unconformity. The specific uranium minerals that are deposited and the associated metals generally depend upon the composition of the reduced fluid. Unconformity related deposits are generally far and away the highest grade uranium deposits and provide the biggest contribution to the Western world's uranium production, with 33% coming from this group of deposits. Most production comes from Canada's Paleozoic and Proterozoic basins, the red areas on this map of North America. Saskatchewan's Athabasca Basin is the crown, jewel in the crown. Many world deposit class of uranium deposits are located here, including Cameco's Key Lake, Denison's Wheeler River, Cameco's MacArthur River and Cigar Lake, and Rio's Rough Rider deposit and Fission and Alpha's Patterson Lake South. You will note that this last deposit appears to be outside the Athabasca Basin, but in fact the basin used to extend south over Patterson Lake before glacial erosion removed it, leaving just the roots of the system in the lower stratigraphic unit. First let's look at Cigar Lake Mine as an example of a typical unconformity related deposit although its grade is high even for unconformity related deposits. And then we'll take a look at two pre-development deposits. Cigar Lake is join jointly owned by Cameco and Arriva and it's under development. At Cigar Lake the mineralization is above, on and below the unconformity, suggesting that the deposit formed over a long period and that the groundwater moved both up and down the basement structure during that time. The deposit has a well-developed clay alteration halo, the orange unit in the cross-section. Beyond that is an even larger bleach zone, blue in the section. The mineralization is buried beneath about 450 meters of largely unmineralized, flat-lying upper Proterozoic sandstones. The basement consists of metamorphosed and folded lower, lower Proterozoic base sediments. In broad terms, the mineralization looks like an almost two kilometer long flattened snake winding along the unconformity and following a basement structure. As I mentioned, Cigar Lake has an incredibly high grade and averages 20% U308. This means that the ore is worth $15,000 per tonne at today's price of $35 a pound. Some sections of the ore deposit exceed a staggering 50% U308. The reserve, not, not resource, at Cigar Lake is 537,000 tons at 18.3% U308 for 216 million pounds of U308. 
Total production is planned to be 223 pounds, million pounds. Production is scheduled to begin in late 2013, and my life is estimated to be 15 years. A recent deal with Arriva and the joint venture partners and owners of the McLean Lake Mill has lowered the forecast production cost to about $18.60 per pound. The, the deposit has had a torrid development history, with major setbacks caused by flooding in 2006 and the difficulty of de designing a safe mine with such a high grade of ore. Then a new second shaft has completed in early 2012, which has allowed development to continue. To avoid human contact with the ore as much as possible, mining will be remotely operated high-pressure water jets. The pulverized ore will then be slurried to surface in pipes and dewatered before being trucked to the McLean Lake Mill. The recovered water will be recycled. Now let's talk about the Rough Rider deposit. It was discovered by Hathor in 2007, five kilometers to the northeast of Denison's Midwest deposit. Hathor was bought out by Rio Tinto in 2011 for $654 million. The total resource at the time of the sale to Rio was 58 million pounds at 4.7% U308. Rough Rider consists of at least three pods of mineralization, all at or below the regional unconformity. This old uh, Im image, Hathor image, shows a vertical section through the three deposits. At that stage, the third pod had only one drill hole intercept. The first point to note is that the individual pods in this type of deposit are tiny. The biggest deposit, uh, biggest footprint, is only 160 by 60 meters. The second point is that the shallowest of the three pods, the original discovery, is at the unconformity and 225 meters below the surface, but the top of the third and deepest pod is 120 meters below the unconformity and it extends to at least 400 meters below surface. The fact that the third pod was so far below, below the unconformity is unusual, but it's not unheard of as another recent discovery shows. Fission and alpha minerals discover new mineralization uh, by following a radioactive boulder train left by glaciers to what they believe to be the bedrock source. As I mentioned earlier, the Patterson Lake mineralization lies several kilometers outside the current limits of the Athabasca Basin. However, the Athabasca sediments once covered this area before they were removed during at least two erosional periods. But some of the uranium mineralization, which predates the erosion, still remains. It's hard to estimate how deep below the un original unconformity the ore formed but it was probably at least a couple of hundred meters. However, the erosion means that the multiple pods of mineralization are now covered by just a thin skin of glacial deposits, and so portions of them are probably going to be open pitable. No resource has been released by fission yet, but the average grade of the drill intercepts, as I write this, is 3.6% U308, not quite as high as the Rough Rider, but the mineralization is much shallower than at Rough Rider. Let's talk a little bit about exploration for unconformity-related uranium deposits. As I mentioned, they are usually blind, that is, they don't outcrop its surface. Not only that, but the Athabasca Basin is in the north of Saskatchewan with its tough winters and transported glacial cover, which makes them challenging exploration targets. Explorationists need a sound, systematic exploration strategy if they are to succeed. Let's look at the steps, starting with first order targeting. <clears throat> Firstly, almost all of these were formed during the Proterozoic, the red blobs in, on the map of North America. So we need to focus on these rocks, particularly where there is an oxidized red bed sediment overlying an older, more reduced sequence. Then we need to add late Proterozoic granites 
and pegmatite extract as the primary sources of uranium in the oxidized red bed sediments. Finally, we need crustal scale faults in the basement to provide a focused source of reduced fluids to cause the uranium to drop out of solution. These requirements drastically reduce the number of potential terrains where we, should, where we could begin uh, looking for these deposits. Once we've established the regional scale targets, we can step down into the second order targeting. Because the deposits are usually overlaid by transported sediments that radiometrics cannot penetrate, radiometric surveys are of little use. Therefore, we have to rely on indirect methods that recognize features associated with fluid plumbing and potential reduction traps. These include various EM techniques and magnetics, and magnetics which can identify structures and graf graphitic units which may provide sources of reduced fluids. Seismics, which detect the steps in the unconformity that may represent fault displacements. And using geochemistry to detect radiation leakage through the overlying sediments. This image shows uranium anomalies in, a la in lake sediments in Quebec. Lake sediment samples are collected by dropping ho a hollow sphere into the lake from a boat or helicopter. <clears throat> Some success has been claimed on sampling lake, lake water for radon, a daughter product of uranium decay. Other exploration methods include identifying clay alteration styles that form a halo around the deposit. Once these indirect methods have been applied, it's time for direct testing in the forming of, form of drilling. <clears throat> when a hole has been drilled, down, downhole spectrometry will give a quick indication of the grade of mineralization before the assays are available. So much for unconformity related deposits. Now I'll run quickly through the remaining type, groups of secondary uranium deposits, starting with the sandstone hosted uh, style. Again, the reduction of oxidized uranium-bearing meteoric water is the key here. In sandstone-hosted deposits, as the name implies, the uranium is deposited in sandy sediments, usually interbedded with shales or mudstones, by coming into contact with plant debris or sulfides that act as reductants. As a result, fossilized wood is often somewhat radioactive. Approximately 18% of the world's uranium resources of the sandstone hosted style, so it is a significant one. The deposits are usually low to medium grade, higher than most primary deposits, but not as high as any unconformity related deposits. The best known areas for these deposits are the Pardo River Basin in Wyoming, South Texas, Niger, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Gabon, South Africa and Australia. In other words, they're, they're pretty widely spread. Roll front deposits are a particular subset of the, of the sandstone hosted deposits. And indeed, they are the most economically important of the sandstone hosted deposit types. Here, oxidized groundwater flows along a reduced sandstone beds, dissolving uranium already in the sandstone and then redepositing it as the water is steadily reduced by organic matter or sulfides in the sandstone. <clears throat> the uranium forms irregular or crescent-shaped blobs where the oxidized sandstone becomes reduced, as you can see in this photo. Uraninite and coffinite are the usual minerals deposited, so the mineralization is usually dark or dark brown or black. In most cases, Roll front deposits are mined in, using in situ leach or ISL technique, and I'll describe the mechanics of this method shortly. The second last group of the secondary deposits are the sufficial deposits. These are formed at the surface due to evaporation of uranium bearing groundwater, so they're usually hosted in recent sediments or soil profiles. Because of the evaporating groundwater contains salts in addition to uranium, the host rocks are usually cemented by calcite, gypsum, dolomite, or iron oxides. Calcrete or caliche is the most common host. 
the original source of the uh, uranium is usually deeply weathered granites and the groundwater that contains uh, drains these granites usually reaches the surface in seasonal river channels and player lakes. So these are the favorite deposit locations. The most common uranium mineral in sufficient deposits is sulfur yellow carnotite. This type of deposit obviously needs low rainfall but high evaporation to form. And Australia and Namibia host several deposits of this kind. Langer Heinrich is a well known example of a kelpreet hosted sufficient deposit. It's hosted by young sediments in a sandy river valley in the Namib Desert that drains an area of uranium rich granites. You can see the sandy river uh, valley running up the center of this aerial view of the uh, operation. The mineralization forms a series of seven flat pods spread out over a 15 kilometer section of the channel. Individual pods vary from just one kilometer, one meter thick to up to 30 meter thick and are over 50 meters to over a kilometer in width. Compare this in, to the uh, footprint that we were looking at earlier of the unconformity related deposits which are tiny by comparison. Langer Heinrichs reserves contain 130 million pounds of U308 at a grade of 0.05% U308. The carnotite that makes up the mineralization occurs as thin films aligning cavities, fracture planes, and individual grains, so it's easily leached. And so on to the last of the deposit types, the quartz pebble conglomerates. These make up approximately 13% of the world's uranium resource, but only a few percent of the global production. They can be either primary uranium producers or byproduct producers, and the average grade depends upon which, uh, which they are. Obviously, the byproduct producers can work at a much lower cutoff grade than the primary producers, but either way, <coughs> grades are generally low. Two of the best known examples are Elliott Lake in Ontario, which is a primary producer, and the Vitvartisrank mines, which produce uranium as a, as a minor byproduct to gold production. The quartz pebble conglomerates deposits can be very large, varying between 12 and 375 million pounds U308. And most of the mineralization is in the form of black uraninite, which is unusual for secondary deposits. So, to, now, to round off this talk, I'll briefly go over how you mine and process uranium ore. There are three mining methods, open pitting, underground mining, and in situ leaching or ISL. The advantage of open pitting over underground mining, quite apart from the economic advantage, is that the hazards associated with radon gas are significantly reduced due to better ventilation in a pit. However, the environmental dust concern is less easily addressed. Most of the high-grade, unconformity-related deposits are too deep for pitting and, underground operation in, and are underground operations. Great care must go into the safety aspect of running a mine. The health dangers are minimized by using remote mining techniques controlled from outside the ore body or even from surface. This involves hydraulic mining using high pressure water jets and pumping the slurry ore to surface or deliberately diluting the ore with wall rock waste to drop the level of radioactivity of the handled material minimizing dust and maximizing ventilation and using radiation badges to monitor exposure and ensure that internationally established safety levels of exposure are not exceeded The third method of mining is in situ leach or ISL. It's also variably referred to as in situ mining, ISM, in situ recovery, ISR, or in situ extraction, ISE, but they're all the same process. It's used in cases where there is a porous sandstone host sandwiched between two impermeable beds, as is often the case with roll front deposits. No traditional mining is used. 
The process relies entirely on boreholes, pumping a solution that will dissolve the uranium in place down one set of boreholes, and then pumping the uranium pregnant solution back up a different set of uh, boreholes to the surface. It relies on the same redox principle that we've seen before, and also on changing the pH. The amount pumped in, uh, the amount of sound solution pumped into the ground is always slightly less than the amount pumped out, so that the solution does not migrate out of the leached area. The solution may be slightly acid or alkaline, depending upon the nature of the deposit, but the solutions are generally pretty benign. Carnotite isn't soluble, but most of the other yellow uranium oxides, such as uranophane, are leachable. How is the uranium extracted from the ore? <coughs> ore from a pit or underground mine is crushed and slurried to the mill. A weak acid or alkaline solution and hydrogen peroxide to oxidize the solution is added so that the uranium dissolves. The uranium is then filtered to remove the now spent solids, uh, leaving just the pregnant leachate. If the mineralization has already been leached using ISL, the leachate enters the circuit at this point. After purification, Ammonium sulfate is added to the solution, which causes the U308 to precipitate. The precipitate is then filtered out and dried, and voila, red yellow cake. So there we have it. As usual, I'll end off with a list of takeaway points to come out of this talk. Uranium is not rare, and it occurs in most rocks. It's just a question of finding the rocks with the higher and more consistent grades. Deposits can be split into primary deposits, those with the, with the, uh, within the original igneous source rock, and secondary deposits, uh, where the uranium has been leached by groundwater and concentrated somewhere else. Primary deposits include IOCGs, and intrusive-related deposits. Secondary deposits include unconformity-related deposits, sandstone-hosted and roll-front deposits, sufficial deposits including calcrete, and quartz-pebble conglomerate deposits. Grade is king. Unconformity-related deposits, such as in the Athabasca uh, deposits, are the Cadillacs of uranium deposits. They have, but they have tiny footprints and seldom outcrop, making them challenging exploration targets. Exploration tools used to find uranium deposits include gamma ray spectrometers to detect the uranium directly, and various electromagnetic methods such as EM, CSAMT, and MAG, and seismics for blind deposits. The key in secondary deposits is to find the redox boundaries where uranium traveling in oxidized groundwater will be reduced and precipitate from solution. The big boys of uranium are Canada, Australia and Kazakhstan. Mining can be from open pit, underground or in situ leaching and uranium mining is no more dangerous than other forms of mining but the emotions surrounding irradiation clouds the issue. Percep public perception is slowly improving due to the, its rise in, as a perceived green energy source, but events such as the Fukushima leak and the, after the tsunami damage set back the uranium industry by five to ten years. So that's the end of this introduction to uranium deposits. Thanks for watching. The next talk in this series will be the exploration process, and I'll take you through a toolbox of techniques available to the exploration geologists. How the search narrows down from regional targeting to defining drill targets, and the development of an exploration strategy.